Hello everyone, I'm Sebastian, and welcome to the MATLAB and Simulink Robotics Arena. In this video, we'll talk about getting started with MATLAB and the Robot Operating System, or ROS. Here with me I've got Pulkit. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Pulkit Kapoor. I'm the Industry Manager for Robotics and Autonomous Systems at MathWorks. Great, thank you. So Pulkit and I will be talking to you uh, throughout this video, and this is actually one of three videos more specifically to this video, which is the MATLAB one, we'll discuss a couple of workflows for how to connect MATLAB with ROS. We'll go through some MATLAB templates as well as an object tracking example, and then we'll end up wrapping it up with some key takeaways. Now, before we move on to the presentation, let's cut to a clip of the object tracking example in action on a TurtleBot robot. So this robot is following a blue circle. It is tracking both the distance away from itself by looking at the area in pixels of the blue circle and trying to keep itself a certain distance away, and also trying to keep the circle centered in its field of vision. Okay, so going back to our presentation, let's talk about the workflows possible between MATLAB and ROS. Let's start with first a, just a traditional ROS-based workflow that might look like this. So you might have a couple of platforms like simulators or actual robots or actual robot hardware, and then what are known as nodes, or in other words, pieces of code that represent things like algorithms or drivers or sensor handlers, and they communicate with each other via this robot operating system, or ROS. Basically, the, and, and I think the reason why we want to do an interface between MATLAB and ROS is that with MATLAB, uh, you know, we provide a lot of capabilities for common robotics algorithms like control or perception or planning and decision making. And there's actually a couple of ways that you can do this. Uh, the first thing is what we call a desktop prototyping approach. So this is something where you know you can have a MATLAB desktop where some of your code might exist in MATLAB, and you want to communicate using ROS uh, with either you know other standalone nodes or with other simulators or hardware, uh, as long as they're connected via the network. You know, you don't necessarily want to have MATLAB running on your final deployed platform. So there is a deployment workflow where you can take some of your MATLAB code and convert it into standalone code that, again, doesn't need a MATLAB uh, environment to run. So that's another workflow that we'll talk about in, in a different video. So what do you mean by run um, on the standalone node? Do you mean run C code? Yeah, that's right. So it, that would be taking your MATLAB code and auto-generating it into C code or C++ code so that, yet again, you wouldn't need MATLAB to, to run your final algorithm after deployment. Right. That's great. Cool. And uh, both of these workflows, in part, can be made possible with the robotic system toolbox. So that, that's the main highlight of, uh, of this presentation and where that ROS interface comes in between both MATLAB and Simulink. So, so really, for the rest of the presentation, we'll be talking about how do you write MATLAB code in a way that we recommend uh, so that it's easiest for you to create these interfaces and, and make sure you take advantage of how modular ROS is. So the focus of this presentation is on the desktop prototyping part and not on the deployment. Right. So we'll have the uh, another further video on deployment. Okay. Let's talk about the desktop approach. Um, the way that we've done this is by providing templates. And again, this, all of these files, all the examples that we'll show you in this video will be made available on the file exchange. And we'll have the link in this description. So your typical uh, workflow as you're you know, creating an algorithm or some component that communicates with a ROS platform is going to follow these main steps. You start with you know, MATLAB and ROS. They, they both exist. They could be on the same computer. It could be on two different computers that are network connected. So the first thing you want to do is set up a connection between MATLAB and ROS. Once you set that up, then you allow the, the two entities to communicate with each other. And the typical loop or you know repeated unit that happens after this is, first of all, you're going to sense. In other words, you're going to get some data from ROS. Uh, that could be, for example, a robot sensor, like image data or, or LiDAR data, bring it into MATLAB, where you're potentially going to process it. Maybe you have an algorithm that does image processing, let's say. And then the output of that algorithm, you can communicate back out to your robot or to your simulator, and we call that the control step. 
and that's that kind of closes the entire control loop, right? Um, we also have, as you see at the bottom, the optional visualization step. This could either be visualization in MATLAB using some of the you know plotting or graphics functionality that that is provided, or the visualization could be on the raw side as well. There's you know you could be looking at the simulator to check what's going on. You could be looking at other you know, sensor packages that may be available outside of MATLAB. I see, and MATLAB and ROS are tightly coupled, and by bringing the sensing data in and processing it in MATLAB, you are taking advantage of all the different toolboxes and the algorithms that are available within MATLAB. Right. How do we, how do we get started with our most basic way to, to actually write this out in MATLAB code? Uh, the way I'm going to do that is by showing a simple loop template. First, we're going to have this setup stage. You want to connect to your ROS master, and you do that with ROS init, as highlighted here. Um, the, the other thing that you want to do is you want to define what data you're receiving and what data you're sending. And in this case, we're doing it with a subscriber and a publisher, as you see there. So who's the ROS master in in this case, if I'm connecting to an external computer running ROS? That's a good question. So in this case, we're assuming that we're already connecting to an, an existing ROS master that's outside of MATLAB. However, you can also create your own ROS master from within MATLAB. And the, the way you do that is by not providing an IP address. So there's, there's multiple workflows. In this case, for example, we might be connecting to, I don't know, a robot that's already running its own ROS master. So once we have the setup, again, we're going to enter the that whole control loop. Uh, the way I'm going to do this is by grabbing the latest message off of my subscriber that I've defined above. There's a couple of other ways to do this. Um, you know, in this case, I'm just getting the latest receive message. There's also, for example, a receive command where you can actually wait for the following message. You can then pass it in to some algorithm. You see, in this case, we've created you know, something called my algorithm, which takes in your received data and outputs something that you want to then send out back to, to your uh, platform. And to do that, you can take that publisher that we defined earlier and use the send command on it uh, by basically packaging up the data into a message and publishing. And just for the sake of showing something uh, visualization related, let's say we then plot that control output against the current time. So my algorithm is a MATLAB function that you write to process that message. Right, and uh, that could you know that could be any kind of function, right? It could be image processing, it could be a controller. We provide this template, and you, as the, the algorithm developer, you probably want to have a couple of these functions that do that processing, and that's really where we want you to spend most of your time developing, right? So there's one piece missing out of here, which was the fact that the sense process control visualize is should be running continuously on your robot, right? So in the simplest of templates, we're just going to stick that into a while loop. Uh, in this case, we're just grabbing the, the time that's elapsed, and we're saying that we're going to continue running this algorithm until we get, say, past 10 seconds. And you'll notice that most of this right here, except for the everything that's italic or highlighted in the video right now, is actually valid MATLAB code. So as long as you know what the IP address, the topic names, and of course you write your algorithm, you can start fitting in right into this template and getting some MATLAB code that works fairly quickly. That's cool. Of course, there's going to be some drawbacks, right? Uh, there's, there's a slight issue here with the while loop, which is if you just let this happen, and that's true of other languages too, then the code that's in the, in the middle or in the inside of that loop is going to just be running as fast as possible. And we may not want that. We might want to have some more control over how we execute this, right? Mm -hmm. So that takes us to the next template that, that we can also show you in the file exchange. Instead of uh, continuing to, to iterate through a loop continuously, there are actually a couple of utilities in the robotic system toolbox called the robotics.rate or ROS rate. And this essentially provides a utility where you can use either your CPU wall clock time or actually looking at the time of the ROS node you're connected to, uh, and you can slow down your algorithm so that it runs in almost real time. You just give it a rate, and then inside the while loop, you just wait for that rate to to finish. And you can have an algorithm that runs 
approximately at that rate, provided it's fast enough to do so. Is this a blocking call? It is a blocking call, yes. Maybe for our viewers, we can explain what blocking is. Yeah. Blocking means that MATLAB is not going to do anything while it waits for this rate to elapse. Uh, in reality, uh, a non-blocking call might be better because you can have multiple things that are running at the same time that are not interfering with each other. And that's where we get into an, another piece of, uh, of our templates, which we've dubbed advanced MATLAB scheduling. So these are a couple of ways to do things in a non-blocking way. Yeah, so the first one is asynchronous execution. Um, and what it means is that you can run a function callback um, and call that callback function from within your subscriber call. And that function will get executed every time that you are getting messages from your subscriber. So that's going to be in the background where just every time a new message comes in, that function will run? Exactly. For example, you know, you're getting your um, sensor data, your real audiometry data, and you want to, um, you know, remove some noise from it uh, and then send it downstream to your visualizer, for example, then you want to run this callback function uh, and not have that, you know, uh, sensor processing be blocking. So the, the other approach that, that we can talk about is actually being able to schedule tasks using uh, what is known as a MATLAB timer object. And you see that looking at the code snippet on the right, this is a way for you to take a function very similar to that callback function that Polkit just described, but instead of doing it asynchronously or every time a new message is received, you actually schedule it. Uh, for example, in the, in the code snippet that I'm showing here, I'm scheduling that function to run at a fixed rate or 10 times a second. And when would you want to use this timer? Yeah, so fixed rate things usually have to do more with controllers, like you know some kind of motion planner, and you want that planner to update itself at a, at a certain rate. Or maybe you're doing something like a PID controller, which actually requires, or it's easier to implement if you know exactly how much time has elapsed between function calls. I see. Now, these are both... They're, they're a little bit more advanced and tougher to implement. We have provided templates for that in the file exchange entry, but there is one warning that we want to give you about these uh, non-blocking approaches. The MATLAB environment to the user is actually single-threaded. So what, what's happening, even though you might have you know, multiple timers or multiple subscriber callbacks going at the same time, they do all have to fit within the same, a single thread. So you know, just a word of warning that you don't want to you know, bloat your your computation with very heavy functions that run on timers or, or callbacks. Uh, especially, essentially, you want to make sure that everything that's going on at the same time fits within the, the rate that you've told it to. Yeah, so if I'm trying to do an image processing function that takes 10 milliseconds, but my timer is supposed to run every millisecond, then that will not be able to keep up. So that's a run through a couple of the templates. I guess there's a couple of best practices that we wanted to also touch on. One of the most important constructs in programming is modularity. Um, and this is the same in MATLAB. Um, and what we mean by that is uh, instead of having all your um, you know, controls, your signal processing, and your sensing functionality in, in one main file, you may want to split that into into separate files or even functions that uh, then then link to your main function. And the reason for doing that is uh, modularity and um, you know reuse of code um, so you can use that same um, control function or visualization function uh, at different places uh, or for different applications. Another reason for doing this is to prevent um, errors from creeping in so you can uh, easily isolate where uh, one functionality might be going wrong instead of debugging uh, one long file. Yeah, and, and to that point, it lets you just test each function individually mm -hmm. um, even before you bring the whole system together, right? If all you've written so far is the visualization function, you can test that on its own and figure make sure that it's okay before you move forward. So That's a great point. Yeah, unit testing is also easily enabled by splitting functionality. Um, the other practice we have is when you're dealing with 
uh, creating robotics algorithms, you're going to have a lot of tunable parameters and a lot of sensors or subscribers or publishers. And it's generally a good practice to store everything somewhere central that's easily accessible. Uh, you could use with things like structures, for example. But what we recommend is actually to use uh, objects or, or classes. Um, and there's a couple of benefits for this. Uh, the, the first one is that with classes, you can actually store both data or parameters and functionality or, or methods all in within the one variable. So that variable can have access to things like parameters, like control gains or or thresholds, but it can also have access to the actual functions that you're going to be calling as part of your algorithm. It's a good way to keep everything together. Um, the second point behind that is when you're dealing with the the non-blocking functionality that we showed you in the previous slide, uh, that is uh, callbacks and timers, having things inside a specific type of class called a handle class lets you actually pass all this stuff in by reference, which means that you can actually have multiple functions poking at the same data. And uh, that's something that we generally want in a distributed framework like ROS. So there's no overhead of passing by value and you're not keeping copies of uh, of your class around in memory. Exactly. So all of that, uh, again, it, it is a fairly advanced concept uh, as far as MATLAB goes, but hopefully the templates that we give you will provide some insight as to how you can develop that. Right. So putting this all together, uh, why don't we go over to our software demonstration for the object tracking example. As we've discussed before, uh, this is an algorithm that's going to first of all track or detect the position of our blue object and then it's going to move the robot to keep that centered in its field of vision and at a certain distance. So I've decided to split this off into two separate functions. I have detect circle which is the one that will detect the circle position and then I have track circle which is the one that will take the circle position and tell us what to do with our robot. Okay, so like I said, this function detects circle, it takes in an input image as well as a resize scale and it outputs the X and Y position and the size of our detected circle. Some of the things that you'll notice and, and some of the benefits of MATLAB is that I get to use built-in functions from say the image processing toolbox like I am resize to resize my image. Then I've actually created a color thresholding and these values I actually received using a uh, thresholding app which, if you're interested in, in seeing more about that, let us know. And then as I scroll down, I'm using a computer vision system toolbox uh, functionality, which is the vision.blob analysis. And this is what I'm using to do circle detection. Um, so I have this function. And before I integrate it with the rest of the system, uh, I actually have a, an example that uses uh, my webcam. So this is the uh, uh, support package from the image acquisition toolbox that will take in my webcam and run the detect circle algorithm. Ah, the good old unit testing. Yes. So what I'll do is I will run this piece of code and you'll see that I come up on the webcam. Now what I'll do here is grab myself one of these blue markers and you'll see that if I hold it, it's going to start tracking. And that's probably a good sign. You see that I've got a visualization utility here that uh, shows me where that marker is on the screen. The other thing that this is doing in, in parallel is it's using that circle tracking functionality. And it was spitting out what the linear velocity and angular velocity it should give to the robot. Yeah, so let's take a look at that function, see what it does. So what this function does is it takes the position of the circle as well as its size and it tries to set, you know, basically the turning and the forward or backward speed of the robot. So essentially what it's doing is if the circle is to your left, then you want to move left or you want to turn left. If the circle is to your right, you want to turn right. And then similarly, if the circle is too big, you want to move away from it. If it's too small, you move towards it. Um, and the way we've done that, if I actually scroll through this function, is I've created a couple of um, you know, if statements that essentially say, if all the conditions are right, then 
I'm going to set my velocity proportional to the error. And that proportional constant is, is being uh, calculated with a parameter. For example, here I've got my linear velocity gain, which maps my pixel size error to my linear velocity. Uh, one of the things we have to figure out is if you are not seeing an object in your field of vision, or your object size is jumping around in an unrealistic way, you need to handle that. Uh, and the, the way that I've done it in this example is I'm keeping a counter of how many outliers in the data I'm seeing and ignoring those past a certain amount. So we got an image of a circle that we're detecting and we got some image processing and we were able to compute the velocity and the angular velocity. So let's uh, try that out on a simulated robot. So what I've got here is an example that uses the gazebo simulator. And I'm going to reuse those two functions, the detect circle and track circle. So I see the same names from our template. I see the setup and the sense here. Yep. So our setup section here, you see what we're doing is we're connecting to the IP address of our simulator. And then we're creating a subscriber for the image data from the robot and then publishing its velocity commands. So, so this IP address of the simulator, where is the simulator located? Yeah, so right now I'm actually using a Linux virtual machine. Um, and you see that this contains a gazebo simulation of a robot. Um, so again, in this case, my laptop is running MATLAB on Windows. And this is a Linux virtual machine. But as long as they have a network connection, they'll talk to each other. And, and by the way, this virtual machine is available for download from our website. So we will be providing that as well. That's great. Then when we go to the loop, as you were saying, Polkit, we've got the sense, process, control, and visualize. And here's where we, first of all, in the sense, we're uh, reading or extracting the image data from our ROS message. Then we're doing using our detect circle and track circle functions for processing. And then we're sending those velocity values as a message. Let's run this whole algorithm. Now you see that this robot is turning as it's scanning. And this is showing me the image feed from Gazebo. And this is running because this is all encapsulated in a while loop. Right, so this is going to just run indefinitely as long as it's going. So you see the robot's kind of taking a step back, and now it's keeping the blue cube centered. Um, I'm going to go into the simulator and actually pick up this object. Let's say if I move it a little bit to the left, then you see the robot will adjust accordingly and keep it centered in its field of vision. Same if I move it to the right. Unless it's out of field of vision, in which case it, it's going to stop for a little bit and then start scanning. Uh, the, the other noteworthy thing is between the, the example that I just showed and one that talks to a real robot, I'm actually going to maximize this and show these two examples side by side. You'll see that the one on the left talks, talks about connecting to Gazebo. The one on the right talks about connecting to the robot. And the code is very similar, with the exception of a couple of things like the IP address and the name of the topics. But then if you look down at the control loop, it's actually going to be identical. If I get down to the, to the same here. So that's one of the great things about ROS, that as long as you, you have the a consistent set of you know message topics or interfaces, then you can actually reuse the same algorithm in simulation as on real hardware. Is this simulation running at a fixed rate, or because of the while loop, it's running as fast as it can? Right. Uh, this is running as fast as it can. So we can actually go to a different example. Uh, now, um, uh, if you see, I've expanded here the timer folder, and I have a an uh, example called gazebo example timer, which does all the same thing, but with a timer. Uh, let me actually maximize that for a second. Here, uh, I'm doing the same kind of setup, right, where I'm defining the IP address, the subscriber, and publisher names. But now I'm sticking all of this into a class called my robot. So this, this is going to contain all my parameters and functionality within it. And then I'm going to use this object that I just created in a timer that I've scheduled. And you see this timer is currently running at 2 hertz. And it's doing everything, so the image processing and the control. Um, so let me run just these two sections of code. And 
let's then go into the command window. Okay, so as this code is running, uh, you'll see that the robot is kind of hidden away somewhere. That's where my uh, what I'm seeing. So what I can do now is if I look at robot.params and I can use tab complete, while this timer is running, I can modify my parameters. For instance, the target size of the robot. Right now, it's trying to keep it at a size of 180 pixels. If I make the target size bigger, like say 300 pixels, then that robot is going to then move forward and keep that object closer than it was before. And you see that on the right, the robot is moving towards towards the box. Another thing I can do is I can change some of the control gains. So for example, I can do, uh, let me actually, robot.params.angular velocity gain. Right now, it's a very small value. If I change it to a bigger value and I, I move the box around just a little bit, I could actually create unstable turning. So now you see that the robot is turning and it continues to overshoot the target. And now it's going in a completely different direction until it loses the box. So here's where I can quickly explore the effects of parameter tuning as this algorithm is running in the loop. Okay, so let me stop the robot timer, which gets rid of that. And now the robot should stop moving. I guess the last thing for us to see in the software demo is all of this working on the actual robot. back keeps the distance the same. See if it follows me around. That's great. It's keeping the object centered in its field of view. So what if you remove the object? Yeah. Like that. It should scan for it. So it looks like it stopped, it's waiting for a couple of counts, and then if it doesn't see the object for a little while, then it should start turning. Yeah. yeah just there like it is. That. And then if it sees the object while it's scanning, then it might pick it up again. Ah, there it is. Awesome. Okay, so now that we've seen a demonstration of the object tracking example, showing how you can connect MATLAB and ROS, let's go into the key takeaways real quickly. So first of all, you saw how MATLAB can be used for desktop prototyping with the robotics operating system. And then we saw that there are a couple of different ways to control the execution of your MATLAB code. Besides just doing a, a loop that's gonna run as fast as possible on your machine, you could, for example, use the wall clock to schedule tasks. You could do asynchronous activities that happen whenever you receive a new message. And you can schedule one or more tasks uh, using timers. And finally, we talked about some best practices for connecting MATLAB and ROS. Uh, that is to divide functionality into separate files because of testability and modularity. And Especially if you want to implement these uh, asynchronous or timer constructs, it's best to keep all of your data in a single uh, class so that you can encapsulate all of that. Well, thank you for watching. Uh, as always, feel free to contact us via email or Facebook, and feel free to check out the other links below.